Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. If you would open your Bibles to Acts 15, to be fair, on Mother's Day, we were preaching in Acts. So on Father's Day, we're going to preach in Acts. All right. I did title this message, though, Beliefs, Business Meetings and Barbecue. <laughs> I think you'll see why. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 15. You may like the barbecue more than the business meeting. I understand. After salvation, there can be a lot of spiritual growth that needs to take place, a lot of refinement and maturity in your life. And the same thing would actually go for the church as a whole. The whole church needs to grow, amen? And we do that individually, but we also grow together as well. And we have seen through Acts 15 that there's been multiple times where the church has had to deal with some things before it grew. Maybe spiritual warfare, maybe differences. And once again, we actually see in our scripture today some differences. So how do you unite you know, two, two very different cultures, a, a Jewish culture with a Gentile culture, but both of them are becoming believers? How do you unite that? Well, this comes to a complete crossroad really one more time. Although I will say that Paul addresses some of this stuff in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, and because of the lack of time, we won't go into depth on that, but it's about the consciousness of what you should eat in front of other people and so on and so on, and what you're permitted to do and not do. Um, in this text today, we're gonna see how there's this difference between Jewish believers wanting to bring their old ways back into, after Christ, back into their relationship with God and want that for everyone around them. Meanwhile, Gentiles are like, well, we've never done that, so why would we do that? So you can see that there needs to be some, there's some growing pains and there needs to be some, some guidance from the church leaders in that. So we have beliefs, we have business meetings, and then because meat is involved, barbecue, but also because I like barbecue, so. I do, I really do like barbecue. So today, uh, my brother marinated steaks for our Father's Day celebration. I'm looking forward to those. <laughs> they are grass fed too, we're trying that out, yeah. So, all right, let's get, let's get to the scripture though, huh? Why not? All right, Acts 15 verse one, while Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, they had been there for quite some time, they're still there. All right, so while they're there, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Uh-oh, here we go. Paul and Barnabas disagree with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by, this, by some local believers to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's joy, that the Gentiles too were being converted. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them, but then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. Let's stop there for a moment. We see in Antioch that Judean Christians, which has also been called, they've been called Judaizers, are insisting that the Gentiles must be circumcised. Now they get to Jerusalem and now a sect of the Pharisees who were also Jewish are saying they must be circumcised. Meanwhile, Gentiles did not practice this uh, and they didn't need to practice this. This was not required of them according to the gospel and what the apostles were teaching, what Peter was teaching. So now we see this uh, debate going on and Paul and Barnabas are arguing with them so vehemently uh, because it's not part of the gospel, it's not part of the grace of Jesus Christ. And this argument goes so deep and so uh, it's so... Um, there's so much conflict going on that they said, you know what, we're gonna have to go to the Jerusalem church, the, the base, so to say, of the church and seek the, the advisement of the elders and uh, the apostles there. 
And so we see this big argument here. Now, you might be thinking today, you know, obviously this isn't a concern at all because, because of this meeting, actually. Uh, we don't see this debate take place today in Christianity because of this meeting. So this meeting was very pinnacle and very important for the, the modern day Christian church as well. And this needed to be dealt with and it needed to be done with. And so they said it's time to have a serious meeting. You do have to understand this, that the Jewish believers at this time, they, that's all they ever knew is that this was the one requirement that, that they believe should still continue. And the reason why God instituted circumcision and many other ceremonial laws and any other civil laws was to set them apart differently from the surrounding nations in the Old Testament. It was to mark them as different, or the word is holy or sanctified. So that was the reason why, and this was a physical rite, R-I-T-E, a physical action, um, a physical ritual, so to say, to mark them as different than all the other nations. So in fairness, this is what they always knew. Even the other apostles were circumcised, uh, Jesus himself circumcised, all these things took place. So you can imagine that this is kind of like a shock to them as well, that the Gentiles don't have to do this, um, and they are. And they want, they're wanting the Gentiles to do this. They're imposing this belief, okay, on the Gentiles. Hence, the business meeting. So let's find out what the leaders decide. Verse six says, so the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, anyone been to a long business meeting? <laughs> this one was probably really long. Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Remember, Jesus prophesied, Jesus said, I would build the church on him. Okay, so Peter is a leader of the church. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts. He knows your heart today, church. And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. You know what he's thinking I hear is the home of Cornelius. That was Peter's eye-opening experience, that even Gentiles could be saved and even be filled with the Holy Spirit. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith, not circumcision, but through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we were all saved the same way, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. So not by some physical ritual, but by, through the grace of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about their miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So you got some heavy hitters in the room here. You have Peter, Paul, and Barnabas. This would have been an amazing business meeting, to be honest with you. <laughs> I would love to be a fly on the wall or sit on the windowsill and listen to this one. When they had finished, James stood, and now we have James, James the, the half-brother of Jesus, okay? James stood and said, brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. As it is written, and this is from Amos, uh, Amos 9, 11 through 12. Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity, so not just Jews, but the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. So James is appealing not only to Peter's testimony, but also to the prophets about this call that God would restore the throne of David. Now, this is 540 some years later and Jesus is born he lives, he dies, and he resurrects, and now he's on the throne. So this has been fulfilled, and he's, he's appealing to that prophecy 
that Jesus fulfills the Davidic covenant that it would always be David's line on the throne. It's a powerful scripture right here. And so James is appealing to that saying, this, is, this has been fulfilled already. And so he's appealing to the scripture to help them believe this. And verse 19 says this, and so my judgment is, and by the way, this wasn't just his own judgment, we read later in a minute through the Holy Spirit, is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, and this is interesting, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. I do need to stop here for a moment and help us to understand this, but did you notice that James completely ignored the circumcision topic and threw on three to four other uh, considerations? Okay, so basically James is like, you're wrong. <laughs> and I'm sure all the Gentiles were like, whew, okay. You might get that later, but... So he says, instead, let's not focus on circumcision because that is, that is not the concern here. We believe by faith, all right? And we have salvation through faith. Instead, let's focus on these things. Now, here's what's gonna happen here, okay? The Jews are offended. The Jewish believers are offended by the Gentile practices, all right? Um, the Gentiles had really bad idol worship in their community. And they would eat the meat offered to idols. I personally probably wouldn't do that, okay? But the Gentiles, that's what they've always known. So as Christians, it is possible that they were bringing meat to fellowships with Jews that were sacrificed to idols. And God said, have nothing to do with idols in the Old Testament. So if the Jews and the Gentiles are gonna to come together and share a meal and then have communion together, which is what they would do, they're like, look, we wanna do that, but we're not gonna eat food sacrificed to idols, all right? Then the next one is sexual immorality. Well, that's a no-brainer. Even Jews should not pra practice sexual immorality. Gentiles in their community, in the Gentile Greek community, there was a lot of deviant sexual practices that were obscene and inappropriate. And, but there's also another connection here, the connection to sexual worship practices too, all right? And so basically it looks like here, James and the, and the apostles, they're saying, look, you need to abstain from all these things you grew up around because now you're a believer, so you need to, you need to be careful. Now, the appeal of that is in Leviticus 18, 6 through 23, of all the inappropriate sexual relationships that we're not supposed to have. If you want to read about that, it's in Leviticus 18, 6 through 23. There's a long list, and we're seeing them in our modern day today still, unfortunately. And the Bible calls us to stay away from those things. This is a moral issue here. This is not a ceremonial issue. This is a moral issue here. The moral issue here is the Gentiles were still practicing wrongful sexual immorality even though they were believers, okay? And so the Jews are like, we can't fellowship with that. Fair enough. It goes on to say the strangled, the strangled meat or blood. Gentiles would often uh, sacrifice their animals by choking them to death. And uh, this is something that God rebuked in uh, Leviticus 17 as well. And um, he talks about that stuff in Leviticus 17, sexual immorality in Leviticus 18. And so they would strangle them, and then there are times in their worship, the Gentile worship, they would drink the blood. Pretty, pretty offensive to a Jewish uh, believer who was told all their life, don't do that, okay? So I think it's really cool. I think it's really cool that James, like, he doesn't ignore their, their appeal for circumcision of Gentiles, which the reason why I said that is interesting and, you know, is like to be a grown man and then have to be circumcised would be terrible. So the Gentiles are relieved by this as well. And it's also not a requirement to be saved. They've never learned that. They've never been taught that once. So why are you telling us that we must do that 
to be truly saved. And let me just put this severity on this. The Judaizers and the Pharisees believed that you had to be circumcised physically to be truly saved. Do you know what the danger of with, with this was? They were wanting them to become Jews first to be saved. That's important for us to understand. You don't have to be a Jew to be chosen by God. You must believe in Jesus Christ to be one of his elect or chosen or to be a family of God. Amen? Amen? So that's the key here. This was a big, important business meeting. This was critical that they got this right. So James, he doesn't necessarily ignore that, but he does say, you know what, there are some issues I see in the Gentile camp, uh, believers that, that need to, they do need to change. If we're gonna have fellowship together, we do need to be careful that we're not practicing some of these things that Moses spoke about, that's being spoke about as well in all the synagogues. That was the last verse there. All right, so it's gonna take time for that to be, you know, kind of weeded out over time. Paul addresses that. Paul addresses this in further detail in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 about what's permitted and what's not permitted. And Paul even says this, idols aren't even real. So he didn't have a problem with eating it, but he didn't, he didn't want to offend anyone who may have a problem with it. Okay, so it's a matter of conscience and personal conviction. Um, so now when it comes to to, when it comes to blood and, and, and things like that and strangled animals, yeah, God had a, a law for that, a ceremonial law. And, but that was fulfilled, that was all been done with when Jesus Christ came. So this is, the things they're wanting to bring in are BC days, before Christ days. But now that Jesus has come, these laws have been fulfilled. They haven't been abolished, they've been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. All right, everyone with me here? Okay, cool. I just thought it was really interesting that James uh, completely sidetracks that topic and says, there are some things that are a little inappropriate that we need to be careful of around our Jewish believers. So I love that he was, he was careful to uh, help the Gentiles not have to go through a physical procedure, but he was also careful for the Jewish believers. I think that's just a good leader, isn't it? A good leader looks out for both parties and tries to bring us together in unity. That's what a good leader does. And that's what James did. And God was using him. So they draft a letter. And they get ready to send this letter. And this is what, this is what it says. Verse 22. Then the apostles and elders together with the whole church in Jerusalem chose delegates. And they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. The men chosen were two of the church leaders. Judas, also called Barsabbas, and Silas. We hear a lot about Silas in Paul's journeys and the missionary journeys. This is a letter they took with them. This letter is from the apostles and elders, you brothers, your brothers in Jerusalem. It is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, greetings. We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. That's important. Wolf in sheep's clothing. Look out for them. So we decided, having come to complete agreement, to send you official representatives, along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. True apostles, they have risked their lives. We are sending Judas and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. Now that is a brilliant setup for a leader to have witnesses Testimony of delegates there in Jerusalem and those who were in Antioch and now in official letter. James has covered every base he possibly could. Verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. See, not just James' judgment, but the Holy Spirit. And to us, to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well, farewell. Boom, that's it. Okay? Verse 30, the messengers went at once to Antioch where they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. So they were excited, thank God. <laughs> then Judas and Silas both being prophets, 
spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. I just love that. I love that, you know, men that know what they're supposed to do, they come into this area and they begin to teach and encourage. We, we need that today, amen? To be there to encourage each other. Verse 33, they stayed for a while and then the believers sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace, shalom. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. They and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord there. We're gonna stop there today. Well, praise God for that. We needed this story to take place. One, because it was gonna be a false teaching. There is no need for a physical ritual to be saved. For my first takeaway, I just wanna share this. Salvation is provided through the grace of God and received by faith. Salvation is provided through the grace of God and is received by faith. Remember Ephesians 2, 8. It says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. So I don't know if you have been raised in a religion or a church, even a Christian church, who has put extra requirements on you to be saved. I just want to let you know, again today, the true gospel says this, that we believe to receive. If you've been raised in a different religion that requires you to do a bunch of things to get God's favor, that's not true. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us before we ever loved him. He shows grace before we ever begin to obey. It's his mercy and his kindness, scripture says, that leads us to repentance. Many times I've talked to people and they say, I got to get right. I got to get right with God. I got to get water baptized to be saved. I got to do this. I got to speak in tongues. No, hold on. Hit the brakes there. Time for a business meeting. And then we'll do a little barbecue, okay? (laughs) We'll celebrate. Hold on. Your beliefs are off. All right? Jesus did the work for you. Jesus paid the price. It's interesting. Salvation is free for us, but it costs God everything. And you you can't earn it because if you try to earn it, then you're going to take credit for it. That's just the human nature. In Ephesians 2.8, again, on the screen, it says, God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. You can't take credit for salvation. All you can do is believe. Now, I will add this on there, and this isn't to add to the faith, but we, uh, I believe that belief also means repentance. Some people have been teaching that you just believe and then you're saved, and I understand what you're saying there, but the full counsel of the word of God shows that belief comes with repentance. In other words, you believe God is right and you're wrong, so you must turn from your wrong way and follow Jesus. When you believe, you confess your sins. You confess Jesus as Lord, not yourself. You confess Jesus as Savior, not yourself. So therefore, you must deny self, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. There is a requirement of repentance and faith at the same time. It's one coin with two sides. It's the same coin with two sides. When I believe, I believe that my sin is wrong and Jesus is right. God is right. God is holy. I'm not holy. I need him to make me holy. Why am I punctuating this? Because I'm seeing it online that you can just believe and you'll be okay. Even the man on the cross felt bad for what he did and Jesus saved him. He didn't just believe. He knew, he recognized he was wrong and he said it. Okay, some people have watered down salvation to say, I believe God exists. I believe Jesus exists. But have you made him your Lord? Because demons believe that. There must be a change of course in your life, a new direction in your life. And you would say, Lord, 
I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe you did everything for me. I believe that your cross, your blood is enough for me. I'm sorry for my sin and I know it's wrong. And so today I'm choosing to follow you and not return to that sin and help me not do that in Jesus name, amen. That's, that's what I did. That's what we continue to do as believers. Amen. I know the devil doesn't like me preaching that because the devil wants us to water down the gospel and make it easy. Number two, salvation performs, you ready for this? A spiritual circumcision of the heart. We're actually all circumcised in the heart. Look at Romans 2, 28 through 29. For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. There's greater context there for that. But you see, there's a circumcision of the heart. There's a change of the heart. To help us understand that better, let's use the scripture. Colossians 2, 11 through 14. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, quote unquote, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. Anyone getting water baptized coming up? You're buried with Christ. And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins, spiritually dead. You were spiritually dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. What does that mean? The power of the sinful nature had not been cut off of you yet. It still had control in your lives. And Paul addresses that in Romans 6 through 8. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Powerful verse. Let me read 13 again. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. In other words, he cut away the power and the control of the sinful nature, the human nature that is prone to sin. When he gave you the Holy Spirit, it no longer had control over you. The Holy Spirit leads you instead. You can read this in Romans 6 through 8. Powerful study on it. Then God made you alive in Christ. He forgave all your sins, all of our sins. He canceled the record. Canceled. It's paid for. Paid for. Forgiven. They bring that, they bring that debt. Amen. Everyone got a, a debt receipt. And they, and they had to bring it, and you know what they found out? Canceled, paid for. Jesus Christ took it by nailing all your sin to the cross, and you are forgiven. You didn't do any, actually, you did all the sinning. I did all the sinning. That was it. And Jesus, what did he do? He did the dying for us. This is what had to take place, the sacrifice of Christ to wash over all our sins. It was done, it was accomplished. But thank you God, he rose him to life again to show that he had victory over sin and death so we also could have victory over sin and death. This is what you're believing in. You're believing more than just the existence of Jesus. You're believing that the power of your sinful nature has been dealt with and now you have the power of the Holy Spirit living your life so you can live a brand new life in Jesus Christ. You are a new creation in Christ. The most important circumcision is the cutting away of the power and the hold of the sinful nature in our hearts. The circumcision of the heart happens through the work of the Holy Spirit. Another way it's, been, it's said in Titus is that when you believe, the Holy Spirit washes you clean, washes away your sin. That's another picture of this spiritual transaction that happens. And this leads, this internal circumcision of your heart, the cutting away of the power of the sinful nature in life, that happens at salvation and it shows by how you live. So yes, did they have some considerations of things they needed to abstain from? Yes, 
The Bible has a lot more than just that. Jesus calls us to live holy like he is holy. He doesn't just cut away something. He wants us to apply ourselves to living like him and to live a holy life. Thirdly, I want us to understand this from the scripture to take this away. Biblical and spirit-led leadership is essential to the health of our church and homes. Fathers, mothers, it goes for both of you. We must be strong biblically. We must be spirit-led and spirit-filled. There is value of having strong, spirit-filled leaders in this church. When they heard, let me, just think about this for a moment. When these Judaizers came in and these Pharisees came in and they said that this isn't right, they must be circumcised. It got all the way to the leaders. What does that tell you? It tells you that they were very influential in the body of Christ. It tells you that they were persuading the church, which was in the thousands. It tells you that, that they had to bring this to the next level of leadership. That we need strong biblical leadership. We need spirit-led leadership who's going to allow the Holy Spirit to punctuate scripture that's already written to guide us. We must be parents like that. Men, we need to be men like this. We need to know the word. We need to know the voice of the Holy Spirit so we can lead. Our kids don't tell us what to believe. Okay, now here's the thing. If you're a Christian, praise the Lord, you need to help teach your kids. Can your kids confirm and help? Absolutely. Praise God for kids who are reading the Bible and, and, and worshiping Jesus and following Jesus. Praise the Lord. But beware, our children are watching TikTok, YouTube, they're on the internet, they're being influenced. And all I'm saying is this, the rate of influence on them, unfortunately, is much greater than our influence on them. Because information being on the internet is so rapid, and we have to counter that with the truth of Jesus Christ. And so let us lead the way and then let our kids also confirm things by what they say. Let us teach the way. You know what? You might want to look at your kids' accounts and see what they're watching so you can now counter anything that's off. I could go a long time on that point. The amount of stuff that I see being taught to churches is, is scary. It baffles me, the stuff that's being taught. Can we just get back to the scriptures? My goodness, it's, there's plenty of stuff in here to learn. I mean, we've been, we've been in Acts almost a year come September. Now we had some breaks with different series. And I'm not even going that slow. I'm, I'm going one chapter at a time at this point, almost. There's so much to teach and learn. Let's make sure we have, like, th this whole deconstruction movement where people are deconstructing their faith. Can I just say something real quick out of love? How about you first construct your faith on the word of God? Because it hasn't been fully constructed yet. We're deconstructing something that's barely built. Once we know the whole counsel of scripture, then you can have a better structure and foundation for what you believe in. Before you start deconstructing, make sure you actually had the right construction in the first place. The word of God, all right? Just, just a fair warning as a pastor here. I care about you. I love you. If you're watching online, I love you. I care about you. But I think we're deconstructing things that aren't even, we weren't even taught right in the first place. Let's make sure we learn the scriptures first and be taught properly. But dads, moms, know the word. This, this should be, we should be investing our hearts and lives in this every day. Because the amount of information being process to our kids is baffling. And as a church, as a leader of this church and the other leaders, um, just so you know that I hold my leaders here at this church accountable to proper doctrine and that we process this stuff together to make sure we're not getting off. All right. And by the way, Pastor Kuhn is very much involved in this church still because I, I, my, my dad is my mentor. 
And so I call my dad and go, what do you think of this? Yep, that's, a, that's a completely accurate. That's what I thought. I just want, I want confirmation. I want to double check that we're proper. Yep, that's it. Thank you. You know why he can do that? Because he knows the word. All right, let me move on. <laughs> let me close with this, just recapping these things. Don't put extra requirements on your salvation where God isn't. Okay, um, I've seen this happen where people go, I gotta, I gotta keep God's love for me. I gotta do these things, I gotta do these things. That's not true. God already loves you. Do them because you love him. I gotta win God's favor and God's love by, by you know, giving a certain amount and serving a certain amount of hours and reading the Bible a certain amount of hours. No, our response to him is a life of worship. Okay, and you should do those things because we love him and we worship him. But it's not out of compulsion, it's out of love. It's out of gratitude. Look, everything belongs to God. Everything. If you think that you should keep back something, you need to check yourself. I need to check myself. I have oxygen because of God. I have energy because of God. I have a job because of God. For me, it's more of a calling. I have a calling because of God, right? I, I, this is all because of God. It all belongs to him. He's not asking you to serve every day, every waking moment. He wants you to sleep. He wants you to be with your family too. He wants you to, to get breaks and go on vacations. He wants you to do all that. He, he loves when we take the Sabbath seriously and rest or, or make a Sabbath in our life. He wants that for us. But here's the thing, we should want to worship him. But you don't have to do that for him to love you. He already loves you. He's done everything he can to show you that. Do not let the devil deceive you there. If you, if you uh, secondly, if you, if you feel like, you know, your sinful nature is stronger than the Holy Spirit, I, I would just encourage you to ask God to change your heart. This testimony you heard on Wednesday night in our small group, discipleship group, we, we, had, we took time to share testimonies in about three to five minutes. And this gentleman said, everything changed when I asked God to change my heart. See, everything didn't change when he started doing everything right. Everything changed when he asked God to change his heart. It's when he asked God to change his heart that he began to do everything right. And he gave us an example. He said, I forgave a person in my life that, that I absolutely hated. And he hated me. And he said, out of nowhere, I was able to forgive. And I was like, we know what that is. That's the love of God in you, enabling you to forgive. And he, he recognized that. He's the one that said that. See, if we, can, if we can ask God to change our hearts, he would change our actions. And he would change our attitudes. Thirdly, a strong grasp of God's word equips us to discern and protect our families and church from the dilution and pollution of God's word. The word of God is being diluted and is being polluted. And if we have a strong grasp of the word, we can discern that and protect our church, protect our small groups, protect our, our families, protect our kids, our spouses. Be careful in the days that we're living in. There will be a great deception, the word of God says. And how do we counter deception? With discernment. With divine discernment from the Holy Spirit, like James did, and the word of God. He made a divine judgment because he had the word of God, the testimonies of his fellow apostles, and he had scripture, and he had the Holy Spirit. He appealed to the Old Testament scriptures. He appealed to his fellow apostle Peter, who was with Jesus and could testify, and he appealed to the Holy Spirit leading him. Amen? That's what we must do. Why don't we stand together? May we have a strong grasp of God's word. There are reading plans in our lobby. If you want to pick up a reading plan, you can use the Bible app. I have two reading plans here that read the Bible in a year, or one that's chronological. If I'm not mistaken, we still have those in the lobby. If you've prayed, if you've believed today in Jesus Christ and you're repenting of your sins and you believe Jesus Christ is right, he's the one that's done the work for you and through him you are saved, 
then we want to pray for you and we want to pray with you. So our team will be up here. I know it's Father's Day and there's some things to do out in the lobby and some, some barbecuing to get to. But there's nothing more important than your heart being right with the Lord. It says, it said in verse eight, God knows your heart. So all the way from the top balcony, underneath, all the way to the front, God knows your heart. And the word says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And confess him as your Lord and Savior, you will be saved. And so if that's you today, would you do that? And would you let us know so that we could help you grow? Let's pray together. Lord, I just wanna say thank you for being a loving, strong father in my life, in our lives. For those who don't have a father, for whatever reason it may be, you continue to be a father. You're the eternal father. And we're so grateful for you, for all that you've done for us. And Lord, I pray you bring healing to our hearts today for those who need it. That you would bring faith to our hearts, that we would have confidence in your faithfulness, that we would trust you. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen our dads and our fathers today, young to old. Lord, we need your strength today. Lord, help us not to be afraid, not just to show up, but to speak up. To speak up for the truth, to love with truth. To show love with our mouths and our hands. Lord, I pray that we would learn as fathers to even give hugs to our kids and grandkids. To express those words, I love you. We can do that, God, because you first loved us and your love is in us. God, I pray that we would occupy spaces in our family's lives, that we wouldn't let them be a void, but instead we would occupy and get close to our kids and our family, our wives. And Lord, for those who are on that journey of still finding a, a life partner, Lord God, I pray that you would provide. And I thank you, Lord, for being a father to the sons and daughters who have no father. We thank you for your faithfulness. You will never let them go. You can teach them. You've taught me with a father. You can teach those without a father. Lord, we thank you for filling that void. And I pray today, God, that we would be careful to preserve the gospel, not to add or take away. I pray, God, that we would desire a changed heart. And I pray, God, that we would have a strong grasp on your word to help us protect the flock to protect one another. We thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. We give you all the glory and praise for the salvations that are taking place in this community, in our church, for the growth that's happening, the maturity in this room from learning. I thank you, God, for a church that actually cares about the word. Thank you, God, for a people who want to be taught the word and apply it. I pray you would help us do that today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.